kind of going to flow. So Kitty's going to start and then, and then, okay. And then it just kind of will have um, green introduce, my house is that, I don't want some leaves and blue, I need the major kind of introduce, mm -hmm. and I'll do this all at one time. And then green is going to go in and do a couple changes. And is this for, yeah, for my thing, do you want to talk about what do you want? Just the agency or about how much you want to add? Just the mission, I just want to kick off a mission with this one. Okay. And then we'll wrap up and go um, chrome, then gray, and then to me it's going to be like a local New Hampshire resident. I know I have to say this specifically to Brian, so I got it. So it's like once they get their seeds in their work and how, how will he sort of be in some communities and whatnot. And then add that in. So is there a chance for me to talk about trauma in one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because um, that could be that could be a section there. So how is your program perceived, and and what you want to do with that? Just so how much time do I have left? At least fifteen minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And we'll watch time, and you'll have enough. Right. And yeah. Wherever you're most comfortable. Yes, I think we have Corinne on. Yep. We don't have a PowerPoint. It's just our virtual speaker. Um, so if you want to. Sure. I'm not. Yeah. As long as people can click their speaker. Yeah, that's fine. So, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Whoops, I don't have a podium, see? So Ray's going to help me out. Um, and so this session is our second in the All In For Health um, track. Intros, this is going to be homegrown care, care you can provide. So hopefully you're all in the right session. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, today we're going to come to learn from these um, local behavioral health professionals, uh, local to their areas, not all local to here, um, and think about how we can create care that is centered around the well-being of our residents and our communities, and how all community members can participate in that. Um, I'm going to just run through some bios for our speakers, and then pass it off to Julia to moderate the panel. So we have first up on our screen, and I'm hearing a feedback, I don't know if everybody else is, but we'll try and make it maybe further away from me, um, is Corinne Cavender, and she is the Behavioral Health um, Solutions Manager at Tri-County Health Network in Telluride, Colorado. Uh, she's joining us virtually, obviously, so we'll just raise your hand if you can't hear or something like that. You need, need us to make that um, a little bit more clear for her, but can you wave at us, Corinne? There you are. Okay. Great, so everybody can see you. Um, Corinne has served in several capacities at Tri-County, including as an AmeriCorps VISTA marketing coordinator and a behavioral health operations manager. She has taught mental health first aid and safe talk suicide prevention trainings. She is now focused on facilitation of the San Miguel Behavioral Health Solutions Panel. Corinne completed her undergraduate work in her home state of Michigan and is now enrolled in graduate study for her MSW at the University of Denver with an emphasis on mental health and trauma. So welcome. Fuller bios for each of these speakers are in your agenda. So if you just click their names, you will have much more about each of them. Um, and then immediately to my left is Ray Merenstein, and he is the executive director of NAMI Colorado, NAMI being the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness. Um, this is a position he started during the pandemic, apparently, in January 2021. But Ray's work history includes a decade of healthcare advocacy in Washington, D.C. When his native Colorado called him back home again in 2002, uh, his work covered philanthropy and healthcare leadership for the past 20 years. 
and among many notable achievements are uh, his work for the Children Hospitals Foundation, Imagine the Miracles, $250 million comprehensive campaign. That stood out for me. Uh, Ray then founded his own company to blend his political media and fundraising talents into RDM Communications. And his graduate degree in mass communication readied him for several award-winning media relations and public outreach campaigns. So Ray's told me, though, that his most important credentials are those of husband and father. So he is father to three. They all live in Denver, and we're honored to have you, Ray. So, and to his left is Phil Wysick, who is our local Keene representative on the panel. Um, Phil is the CEO of Monadnock Family Services, and this is a role he's held since 2012. And prior to that, he was the president and CEO of the Mental Health Association of Connecticut after serving 17 years as the VP of Operations for the West Central Behavioral Health in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, Phil currently chairs the Executive Committee of the Leadership Council for a Healthy Monadnock, that's here in this area, and has been the facilitator of the Healthiest Community Advisory Board. He also recently completed a work of fi fiction called Pushed Down Then Out, which is a story about individuals with mental health and trauma on the fringes of a future society. With a graduate degree in counseling psychology, Phil has taught a variety of courses, both online and as a lecturer at Granite State College. And Phil and his therapy dog volunteered for years at the Cheshire Medical Center here in Keene. So thank you for joining us, Phil. Um, and our speakers today have opted for an informal discussion session that will follow a brief interview, overview of their unique perspectives on the care you can provide to create a healthier community. Um, Julia Johnson, our health track leader, is going to be facilitating and moderating the Q&A as we get going. So jot your questions down because there will be an opportunity for each of you to participate in this discussion. I'm going to jump down off the stage so that I have the microphone down there so that your voices will be captured both on our recording and for any online participants that we have joining us. Um, but I believe the order of operations is that Corinne is going to start with an overview of some community-based tools. And Ray will then speak more to the policy changes that can impact community caregiving. And Phil will talk about a current effort here on the ground in the Manadnock region, the MAT. And Great. they'll take it from there. So Julia, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Kitty. And I just want to thank you for all the work you've been doing. I'm really grateful. Um, so to begin, um, I would like to ask um, Corinne to sort of introduce Mental Health First Aid. Um, both her and I actually work together as mental health first aid instructors in adult, youth, and teen. Um, but I'll have her kind of touch on what mental health first aid is, and then also um, talk about Safe Talk Suicide and the AFSP Out of the Darkness Walk. So Corinne, could you share with us those uh, missions and your primary focus in both of those community educational classes? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. So the host muted me, so I got a little nervous. Um, so starting with mental health first aid, what that is and why we do it in our community is because it really teaches our community how to have mental health conversations and where to point towards resources on a grassroots level. So we, as a rural community, have a lack of providers and a lack of providers that have actual availability to see people. So what we wanted to do was bring mental health first aid in to be able to teach lay people how to have mental health conversations and then how to educate them on where to kind of hand off to a more professional resource. And that has gone really well in our community, um, just kind of on that grassroots level. And then specifically, we've had a lot of issues with deaths by suicide. So we teach Safe Talk Suicide Alertness courses, which is like mental health first aid, but specifically about suicide. And what those what we like to think about with those classes is that they're like CPR, but for mental health challenges. And if we can have our whole community educated in these courses, then we're just safer in general. Like picture if nobody knew CPR, we'd be a lot less healthy as a society. So we're kind of trying to have that same mindset with these courses as well. 
And then additionally, we do the AFSP Out of the Darkness Walk. Um, AFSP is American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and that really just raises awareness for suicide prevention programs that can be available in the state and then also locally in our area too. And our walk is actually this weekend. So got a lot of, got a lot of planning to do. It's busy right busy. now. It's September Suicide yeah. Awareness Month, so she's very busy. Um, and we'll circle back and talk about how you can kind of bring these grassroots community mental health education classes home with you, these tangible kind of model projects. Um, and then also more about how to bring awareness and be stigma stompers so that we're, we're all open and able to talk about suicide and, and mental health awareness. Um, so we'll circle back to Corinne in a moment, but I'd like to ask Ray to sort of introduce NAMI, um, its mission, and your primary focus. Thank you, and, and let me, I would be remiss. There we go. Turn it off. Got it. One, two, there we go. There. So I would first be remiss if I didn't acknowledge one other role that Corinne plays, and she actually sits on the NAMI National Alliance on Mental Illness, San Miguel Ure County Steering Committee. The reason I hesitate as I say that, the structure of NAMI by its very nature is grassroots in its movement. To those who know the history, it was a bunch of moms around a dining room table saying, we don't know what the next steps are, we need support. And so support groups grew out of that over 40 years ago. They became evidence-based. And our reality from that day forward to where we literally sit today is, how do we keep innovating? How do we keep creating for groups that need us most? And whether that be a specific demographic within a rural area or the vast rural area in and of itself, we don't necessarily have that answer. So there are 600 affiliates, much like San Miguel Ure, that are telling us at the state level, and then us at the state level are saying to national, these are the resources we need. So in southern Colorado, we know there is a growing indigenous population, and we know there is a growing Latino population. So doing a family support group is not a culturally competent way to move into that for the Latino population as an example. There may be barriers, whether it be transportation or childcare or culturally that you don't talk about mental health in a setting, you don't go to a therapist, all of these things. So we have to learn about it, but we also know that any one community, Latino community, black community, Jewish community, is not homogenous either. So we have to understand what those needs are. Um, I, being from the Jewish community, if I was going to be sitting in on a group therapy session among the clergy, depending on whether I'm Orthodox or whether I'm conservative, reform or reconstructionist, may choose who else is going to be in that group with my observance. So we go to the NAMI affiliates and we work with them and we build from there. So from family support groups grew family to family and family and friend education groups. From the family support concept became a peer concept and then the peer connections group concept. From that came home front, looking at veterans and resources for their families. And now we move into sharing hope for the black communities, which are conversations about mental health and then may lead into peer-to-peer -peer or connections or family support. We have Compartiendo Esperanza for the Latino community. And as we continue moving forward, especially post-COVID, we're looking at NAMI provider and NAMI frontline wellness, which are ways to actually provide the resources for the people like Corinne and Phil and, and all those other providers that are out there who may be struggling themselves, but also may be making assumptions because they're not in the mental health care arena directly. So we are really excited to be a 40 plus year old organization, but we're also a 40 plus young organization when it comes to the mental health space. Thank you, Ray. And I can, I can speak to that. He's actually, as a NAMI family to family instructor, they've made it a very um, important essential thing to make sure it's translated in Spanish and to reach all people um, and that everyone's trained in this. You get a tangible take-home book that's this large <laughs> and you learn all about evidence-based information, information, early onset of mental illness, how to support conversations and what to say. And it's, it's been such a lifeline um, when working in this field and even for people that are working outside of the field, like he said, the mothers around the table, um, how do you have those hard conversations? The, you know, 
director of an organization, how do you approach your employees um, if you're noticing signs and symptoms of early onset depression? It's incredible work, and I, I thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to take it over to Phil now, ask you to introduce uh, Monadnock Family Services, its mission, and your primary focus. Thank you, uh, Julia, and thank you, everyone, for uh, being here and joining us this afternoon for this uh, our conversation today. And I guess my vantage point of entering this discussion is for, um, or basically through my years of experience as in the provider community. Um, I have worked in community mental health um, pretty much all my professional career. Um, and um, just a little bit about my organization, uh, I would say that uh, in New Hampshire, where um, we're one of 10 uh, community-based organizations that are sort of have a quasi-public mission. We are a private company, but our obligation is to the general population in this region. The region being um, the greater Monadnock region is about an uh, area of 34 towns, about 100,000 people. All, all of them, uh, all of our towns, rural, and um, so my organization is the main mission is to provide care for adults with severe and persistent mental illness or kids with severe emotional disturbance uh, we're an organization of about 185 employees uh, and have been on the in the ground um, here in the region for about over 100 years so that makes us old but um, still we're learning every day about how to deliver community-based care in, uh, in our midst. Um, so my primary uh, function is as chief um, executive officer, which means uh, I keep the doors open and the lights on and people motivated to do their job. Um, and like other employers, there's not enough of those people at this moment to do those jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's presented new challenges to us, uh, particularly because um, you know we don't have a pool of ready workers um, in a rural community, as probably many of you know. Um, every sector of society seems to be, in my view, affected by the changing demographics of the workforce. Um, we've got a couple of irons in the fire about how we're going to address that and adjust to that. Um, and I think in those innovations, um, things will be better for our clients and our families in the process. Um, so in addition to being uh, mostly having a provider lens, um, I also have, uh, over the years of being in this particular role, uh, a public mental health lens uh, through our work um, with our Community Health Improvement Plan and our Public Health Action Network um, that we call the Leadership Council for Healthy Monadnock. Um, and that's where um, our vision in the area to become a trauma-informed community has come. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you about that when the time comes right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Phil. And I'm so happy to have you here because you've got the direct connection to Keene and it's, it's great to, we'll, we'll be opening up to questions and answers so we can learn more about that specifically. Um, so to begin the panel discussion, I'm gonna ask Corinne first um, a couple of questions about her experience specifically as a community mental health educator. So I wanna ask, can you please share about what we're learning around the impact of educating communities through evidence-based research models like mental health first aid? Yeah, I think so. There's three different levels with mental health first aid that I teach. There's teen, youth, and adults. And I'll start with teen because it's the newest. What I'm learning about the teen class in that evidence-based model is that the teens really don't have the stigma yet that we talk about with mental health first aid or with mental health in general. So teaching that class is actually really easy because they get it. Um, they're like, yep, that makes sense. We should care about this. We should care about our friends. We should talk to adults, all of that stuff. Um, so that's really cool to see that on that level, that stigma hasn't entered their lives yet. So it's really easy to kind of flood them with resources and kind of hit that population young so then they don't, you know, develop stigma, hopefully, or as much stigma as they would um, that society allows at this point. For those youth and adult classes, I think it's really just showing our community the evidence behind it. Um, I mean, the whole evidence-based thing, I think, is kind of a buzzword these days. But really showing our community, like, hey, in our community, in our rural community, 
evidence shows that if you take these classes, you're going to be using what you learn. And if you didn't take the class, you're still going to be in those tough situations where you need to talk about mental health, uh, but you might not have the resources. And overall, it's just creating a safer community that we all have that groundwork knowledge from all of those mental health first aid classes. Great, thank you. So how is shifting the focus from the sort of clinical level of behavioral health care, um, school psychologists and psychiatrists and just LCSWs and therapists around to that of the community model approach supporting this current mental health um, crisis that's coinciding with the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I think, so I'm gonna be very blunt here. <laughs> One of my biggest, um, struggles with this kind of field is so many people want to act. They want to jump in and they want to, you know, make a tweet that says, you know, mental health matters or I care about suicide prevention. But then when it comes to action, like taking a class or joining a walk or doing that sort of thing, um, they're less likely to be engaged unless we're on them and really showing them that, that we need that engagement. So I think it's shifting from Having our communities learn that, yes, there's professionals and we need professionals and we need more professionals all the time, but also we're not going to be able to accurately and efficiently address this crisis if we don't go to that community level and we don't educate on a community level. It's like saying that, and I compare everything to physical health, but it's like saying everything all of the time that you go physically, you have to go see your doctor for it's just not true. We need to learn how to put a Band-Aid on sometimes. We need to learn how to, you know, take and things like that and when those things make sense. So it's kind of that same knowledge shift of like, okay, no, we need you to know this because we don't have enough providers. Just kind of coming off this, do you, do you think at Tri-County you guys have found a strong approach to bring people to these classes? Is it social media outreach? Is it conducting a focus group, you have a newsletter, like what can we share with the audience of how to bring people to these classes? I think in some of our counties, we're really good at that. Um, and others that we're still kind of still breaching that topic. In San Miguel County, specifically in Colorado, we've just been doing the classes enough and like knocking on doors enough. And it's been years and years and years, even before I was at the organization, that that outreach was being done. So now it's been established in the community as a course that people should take and is really important for the safety of our community. We're just starting to kind of do that same kind of outreach in other communities. I'm going to be honest, the outreach isn't the same. It's very different. Um, so understanding kind of the demographics of the community you're going into and then how to make the class attractive based on those demographics. So like, for example, San Miguel County is like very liberal, very progressive. Like it's really easy to kind of intertwine that way of thinking with mental health first aid. But then we have some counties that are very like, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Like we can't be weak it's like that ingrained in those communities, but then showing that those messages can still be um, kind of used in mental health first aid and that it's not weak and that it's not, you know, someone's fault. Um, so I think it's really just catering to the community that you're working with. Yeah. Have you approached different partners to kind of team with them to get their whole like organization? Yeah. So using yeah. like, gatekeepers and finding I stakeholders. Think that's the easiest way is to kind of approach a human resources department or someone that you know maybe has some lived experience in an organization to then kind of tap their team and say, we all need this. Um, just doing a class for the community is just harder in a rural area to get people involved in. One, because the marketing strategies just aren't there um, and they aren't as successful in my experience. So using those those partnerships and connections is easier to get people in a room. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so can you share kind of a, a couple strategies and examples of how um, communities can implement um, these classes, community health classes, the walks, um, specifically kind of talking about your time on the behavioral health solutions panel and how you passed um, that ballot issue? 
So yeah, we'll start with the last, the latter, and then move into all the other ones. So in San Miguel County in Colorado in 2018, in response to way too many community suicides, um, a ballot measure was passed that created a mill levy on all new properties that goes into a fund that goes for behavioral health services in San Miguel County. So there's a panel that actually votes on budgets and grant applications and all this stuff. And it's just for behavioral health services for people who live or work in the county. So I think that's huge in being able to implement anything because now we're able to offer free classes because of that funding and other kinds of supports that that panel I mean, we all know that funding is always our one of our biggest barriers. Um, so we have that and that's kind of huge. And that first step is finding that funding and finding people who really want to fund and understand the how important that impact is. And then I think as far as just getting the community involved in making these classes happen are just like talking about it and talking about it and circling back and not just assuming because someone didn't respond to an email that they don't want to do it. I think we have to have the assumption that everyone's so busy and at some point they'll likely want a class especially if it's free if we just keep tapping them keep tapping them um, and showing them that we really care about them and want this for their staff for their family or the community whatever it is um just keep continually showing up for your community and then they'll they'll eventually follow suit and do their part too and take that class yeah well thank you so much for continuing your advocacy and spreading the word so that they do know they're, they're there, that the classes are available. She also does tempt them with um, free lunches, so that's uh, anybody needs support with that, that's what she does. Feeding people um, really does help, but it sounds like a joke, but the amount of participants we get when there's food versus not food is huge, so another good yeah. plug. Yeah, and then when, when things happen locally in, in Telluride, um, they're on it with trauma response and, and how to reach out to support the community. So if there is a local suicide, we've, we have people available to sort of support not only with our community health classes, but evidence and link them to like our online therapy program. But she is responding as, as these traumas occur, um, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, Corinne. Thank you. Um, so as we just heard from Corinne, um, Ray, I, I'd like you to kind of talk about with the community mental health educa education class theme, um, can you talk to us about how NAMI designed their classes, evidence-based, trauma-informed care, and projects in general, and how they're implemented? It is, you, you said how we designed. <clears throat> I'm gonna challenge you and say how we continue to design. How we are always it, right? designing, yes. It is, um, and I'm gonna put this on because I printed out SAMHSA's, um, the trauma-informed approach that they talk about the six principles. And as you begin to understand them, but you infuse it with a little bit of policy and a little bit of what I'll refer to as Main Street mindset. And I think that's the most important thing I want to impart to all of you today, is as you walk down any Main Street in America, or whatever that street may be named, you will see likely a church, you may see a barber shop, you'll see a library, Think about the individuals that are working within those walls. The banker, the barber, the salon, the librarian. And if we can do a better job in educating those individuals about signs of mental illness or responses and resources. I mean, after all, for, since Andrew Carnegie funded libraries centuries ago, this reality was they're the place that we go for a trusted resource. So doesn't it mean that the bus driver, the librarian, the barber would be a place that we begin to have conversations about mental health? So in that context, the very first principle of SAMHSA's trauma-informed care is safety. So let's make sure that we have facilitators because we are a volunteer model. You take a course, you then get trained to teach that course, and then you teach that course. So imagine if we had more barbers and librarians and bus drivers taking these courses and they had the understanding, the cultural competence in the settings that they're in. That's the beauty of that. Uh, that sixth principle is making sure that we set it up in a safety way. Then trustworthiness and transparency. That when we get a call on our helpline, if we can't help you, 
we're not going to hang up on you. We're going to say, let's explore together why you're going through what you're going through. We don't say what's wrong with you. We say, tell us your story, right? Go back to the librarian concept, is if I have a better understanding of your values and your interests and who you come from and where you come from, I have a better chance of helping you. So in that context, we want to be able, and NAMI has just recently created this concept of going into the barbershops and actually having conversations about mental health in that community because it's that trustworthy space. But then you get into the most important model, that third principle of peer, which is peer support. And that's really been the power behind NAMI. Um, there is a place um, now, popping up all throughout the nation, and the rural areas I think may be one of the best places for it actually, is a hotel-like setting without hotel rooms, but it does have the living room, it has the great room, it has the piano room, these things that provide comfort, and when a first responder picks someone up, hopefully through a co-responder program that's a police officer and a social worker, or through the model that was out of Eugene, Oregon, the CAHOOTS program that's now called STAR in Denver, and those programs are an EMT along with the social worker, they would then take you to this recovery-like setting that is not a jail, it's not an ER, and it's not a sobriety house. It is a recovery home and that opportunity to stay there. So yeah, there's a lot of issues with can we build it, who would work at it, Phil will talk about the challenges related to those kind of things. But the first person you see when you walk in is up here. You don't see someone in uniform and you don't have someone that's going to tell you what's wrong with you. You've got someone who understands you. And then we move into collaboration, which Corinne talked about all the different organizations. The fifth one's empowerment, voice, and choice. You go to peer support, you then can be one of the people that provides it in our own voice to a crisis intervention team training with your local police academy. And no matter where we are, right, I've seen the police go by here once, I've seen an ambulance go by here. So again, imagine that peer now providing in our own voice and telling their backstory to the ambulance fleet, to the police academy, to the firefighters, and then ultimately understanding the culture. I'll end on my piece of saying one of the things that we're working really hard on NAMI is acknowledging that we are not the ones with all the information, but going out to a community. My daughter, born with a rare genetic syndrome called Pfeiffer syndrome, is deaf but uses a hearing device called a bone-anchored hearing aid. Still to this day, whenever we watch Netflix, she wants the captions on. So that question becomes, when she goes to school, when she's at a movie theater, when she goes to a peer support or a support group, if she wanted to, are they using captions? Does she feel empowered to ask them to use captions? So if we can continue to meet people where they're at and provide them the space to say, you're the one that's going to teach us and we're going to learn from you, we can better equip ourselves for peer support and family support and all of the other kinds of things that we're talking about collaborating down in a local community, whether it be here on Main Street or down in Telluride, as Karen was talking about. Great. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, so I appreciate you sharing the details of kind of the community health models, where to find the place, set the stage. Um, I want to say congratulations on the 988 intervention program. Um, can you kind of share with us, the audience, how NAMI advocated for this change at a federal level? So kind of switching from community to now policy and federal. It's really important when we had talked about the model that is 600 affiliates and then 48 states and then the national. And so imagine the power of the voices is the keynote speaker, right? When she came and she was saying that she knocked on 20,000 doors. That's the reality. We had a knock on 20,000 doors multiplied by 435 congressional districts. And so if the average congressional district is 750,000 individuals times 435, you're getting to the 350 million people that plus live in America, and every one of them is taught 911, babysitting class, lifeguard classes, schools, libraries, right? 
So we said, what if we can have that same concept? And this was not NAMI alone. This was NAMI. This was Mental Health America. This was the American Society for Suicide Prevention. All of these organizations coming together. What we knew is there were examples of mobile crisis response already existing in communities, and that if we didn't have something federally mandated like 988, the rural areas were going to be left behind. By saying 988 needs to come online and it's going to be statewide, it forced the hand in Colorado as an example to say, are we prepared to make sure that if someone in rural Western Slope calls 988, we're going to be able to provide them the response we need. So 988 is really the beginning. It's the first call, but we've got to know that the back end is there. So our policy has moved very much to a state level where New Hampshire, as an example, said we have to make sure that telehealth is reimbursed at a rate similar to physical health and that if there's not a counselor available in New Hampshire, is there a like licensed counselor across state lines that could also provide the service. So when that 988 call comes through, I can connect you with that telehealth appointment that may not be right here on Main Street, but it may be in Main Street in Connecticut somewhere in that town. Right. Can, can you kind of speak on how rural communities um, can work with you and with 988 to build that foundation, that response center? I will tell you one of the most important things is train someone in your own community, right? If you're doing it and they're trained in mental health first aid and then they become part of that call center, we know call centers are basically virtual. You could be doing it from an auditorium in Keene, New Hampshire. The reality is as long as you have a phone or a computer that can answer those Google calls that come into a call center, and whoever that call center partner is, whether it's the state patrol, it's the AG's office, there's all these different models across the 50 states, they need people to be trained to answer those. Mm -hmm. And so if we can increase that workforce, and the, there are dollars there to pay individuals to do this work because it's vital work, and you can choose your hours with it. So if you're doing it as a volunteer time when it's not your day job or your night job, depending on what you do, it's gonna be really important. So communities doing that. The other is advocating with your local state senator and your local state representative to make sure that you have a mobile crisis plan in place. That may be just the police officer having a social worker doing a ride along. It could be a social work student like Corinne is doing that with the police officer or a ride along with the ambulance company. So go ask your state rep and your state senator and if you don't know who they are, please get to know who they are. And if they're newly elected in November, be the first person to knock on their door and say, you want to know what their plan is for mobile crisis in your community. Thank you so much. So in, in your perspective, what are the next steps in policy reform for behavioral health advancement in this country? This is, I may get a hug from Phil because I'm gonna say workforce. Yeah. Um, this reality of how do we recruit, retain, and recognize the three R's. They're not just reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. We really have to recruit, retain, and recognize the individuals that are providing the care and the services that are needed to not only help those with severe and persistent mental illness and their families, but early intervention and prevention if we can catch this stuff earlier. So, are there dollars going into prevention? Are there dollars going into the workforce? And then ultimately, there's a bed crisis all across this country. But that doesn't mean you have to open up a new hospital. You could open up this recovery model that I was talking about that provides a safe, short-term peer support setting. So if we can increase the number of beds between sober living, transitional housing, supportive living, all of that, so it's beds, it's workforce, and ultimately, it's more dollars to put into mobile crisis. Recruit and require. Wait, it was rec hey, but I don't use it the right way. <laughs> Work is life. I love it. Well, thank you, Ray. Um, so what we're hearing is that there's multiple sectors kind of responsible um, for creating that healthy, safe community. Um, and it, it is our responsibility to, to do that as a community member to make sure everyone's okay. So this means that we all must be really intentional about creating those rural communities. And I, I want to take and shift directions, Phil, to you to talk a, a little bit about, as a local New Hampshire, I hope I'm saying it right, residents, how, how is mental health first aid and your, your trauma-informed models, um, 
how are they being received in this area? Yeah, thank, thanks for asking that question. Um, and I guess the, con the comments that Corinne made and the, uh, Ray made sort of, uh, you know, prompt me to want to first point out before I answer your question is that, you know, there, there's much, it seems to me, a temptation to think mental health equals therapy. Mental health equals meds, right? And that equation might be true for many, many people. However, it's not always true for all of us all the time, right? Because mental health, like physical health, is on a continuum. And all of us have some degree of mental health right now at this very moment, right? So it's part of our being. And so in a program like mental health first aid or psychological first aid or a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer passage from NAMI, um, recognize that it's not always about treatment. It could be about just what it says, first aid, and maybe that's all you need, right? Because we're all human beings and we all have stresses and we all have worries and problems and things that influence our thoughts and feelings and behaviors all the time, right? So mental health isn't always on the scary end of the spectrum, <laughs> right? And so recognizing that fact, an important program like Mental Health First Aid tries to give people who are taking the class new information, new perspectives on self-care, self-help, wonderful things that they can do, right? And in, in my perspective, a community that recognizes that is also a community that supports mental health. So if there are bicycle paths in your community, if there are swimming pools, if there are safe streets, nature, that all helps all of our mental health in some subtle ways that we all need as human beings, right? So it's a, a, a responsive community is more than just having a bunch of providers, even though that's very critical and I completely agree. But let's face it, most rural communities in the United States do not have a mental health provider yeah. at this point in time. They're not on every street corner. And so what do we do as a community to try to make sure we're all as mentally healthy as we possibly can be? And a lot of that is, as Corinne said, around education, because for too many years, our society has stigmatized mental health, mental illness, right? We've pushed it in a corner. And 988 is a wonderful example of how that stigma is slowly, slowly dissipating. Because now we've got on a federal level that people have mental health crises. They're not the same as 911. You don't need the cops. But you need a professional that might be able to help you in that, in that instance, right? So it's a huge, wonderful sign that our country is finally sort of turning a corner in some of the prejudice that we've had towards this uh, illness and this affliction. So, um, so I guess from a um, general health point of view, you know, the, the commun communities, especially rural ones in my view, can do a lot to promote mental health uh, by the way we organize ourselves, by the social fabric that we have. You know, um, Communities of faith communities are wonderful oases, if that's the right word, for promoting mental health, right? Because they can be welcoming communities. They can be uh, with, their, with their arms and wi wide open for people who may be having, uh, you know, a difficult time, going through a crisis, having stress, whatever the issue is, right? So vibrant communities can promote mental health, in my opinion, in, in a big way. And I think uh, that's where we smaller rural types have an advantage because we can build that community a lot easier than they can in San Francisco or Los mm -hmm. Angeles or New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I have to, I'm very fond of telling the story when I first took this job here in you know, this little corner of New Hampshire um, when we were, uh, you know, we're, we're a community mental health center. Okay, great. So, but when I took the position, people from the community, the, you know, the mayor guy and the doctor at the hospital and some housing people, they wanted to come and meet me. And basically their message was, we need you to succeed. Which was a great message. And I thought, this is the first time in my career that a community embraced a community mental health center, <laughs> mm. as opposed to being some back alley someplace, you know. Um, they knew that we were, we provided an important part of the social service safety net. and that our well-being, uh, the community's well-being depended on our, our well-being in some way, uh, which was a huge difference that I, I don't think exists uh, in many, many communities. But um, 
I'm very proud of saying that our area has a lot of social capital in that regard and supports uh, mental health. So um, uh, I had a thought and I lost it, but uh, <laughs> you're asking me about how important it is, our education and events like that. I think it, it, does, be, it does become very, very critical to uh, progressing as a country on how we're going to deal with the mental health challenges that we all, every community faces. And it also seems like the community, I mean, showing up here today, even having things like Radically Rural, working in that system thinking sort of mentality of let's share our model projects, let's share what we're doing all over, it's supported and welcome. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear the community welcome the clinic, and then I'm happy to hear that, you know, we're, st we're still all continuing that conversation by joining these sort of summits and, and presentations like this. Um, do you feel like your community is, is ready and equipped to implement 988 at this time? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, to, to you still. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, New Hampshire started 988 uh, in July, um, after, and we also started mobile crisis around the state in January. Uh, it, it started with a lot of um, fits and starts and bumps along the way, and uh, th things are smoothing out. So um, it's, uh, and everyone is, um, really excited to have this new innovation in care available to the citizens of New Hampshire. Um, what we're not too excited about is that um, we have such a shortage of um, clinicians who can uh, be doing the mobile crisis work. Um, that's a bit of a challenge that we'll have to continue to face and solve, but the, um, the um, innovation that 988 is in mobile crisis is just significant. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, so. While we have some New Hampshire residents here, I, I wanted to ask you, what support do you think your clinic and your community still needs? Like in regards to more people showing up to classes, or, or do you feel that everyone is and they are showing up? So maybe that question I should have scratched off. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what supports do we need? Um, well, I, would, I will say uh, that, um, uh, I have to choose my words. New Hampshire is a very frugal state, and mm -hmm. so we don't like uh, a lot of taxes, mm -hmm. and we don't like a lot of intrusion in communities as a very sort of, you know, rugged New England kind of place. Um, I've always said, though, that sometimes you can be penny wise and pound foolish and not support the things that give you the bang for the buck down the road. So. The financial resources are key to keeping organizations thriving and people well paid. Uh, the other important resources, you know, we've said a lot, is about the uh, number of professionals, not just graduate level professionals, but bachelor's level people and nurses aides and LNAs and the whole strata, psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and nurses, the whole uh, army of people that we need to provide care is uh, getting older and thinner. Um, so that's a resource that we've still uh, struggle with. So uh, what the solution is, I am still, uh, still looking for that solution, uh, but I think it's going to be with us for quite some time. Great. Thank you so much. All right. I'm now going to open up uh, the conversation to the audience. Um, so if you'd like to ask any of our panelists um, any questions at this time, Please feel free. Great. And I'll have Kitty come around. Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here and doing this panel and, and having this very important discussion. Um, so I work in disability policy and specifically in the area of assisted suicide um, and recognizing that that's um, a policy that's legal in Colorado. I'm wondering how that has maybe influenced um, your practices or kind of colored the, the way that you do suicide prevention work um, and kind of what that has looked like for you. Nothing like diving right into the complex yeah, questions. <laughs> um, it, it is fine and I think it's appropriate because I think that is an example that we have to be willing to have the difficult conversations. And that's been, I would wanna say the, the 
Google Goggle type of trajectory, right? They said that to create the Google Goggles, it took them eight years for the first prototype, then six months for the second prototype, then three days for the third prototype. These issues are surfacing as we now can more openly talk about suicide. We go into, I think Corinne was the one that said it, the next generation talks about mental health and they understand you have to ask your friend if they're considering self-harm. I think we can ask the same questions. What is the situation, whether it's medically or is there some mental health history related to this as you go down that road into the types of legalities of why one state would be supportive of assisted suicide law and another state might not. But it doesn't change the same way we would treat someone if, and, and I think what's really important is it's often within a co-occurring disorder that it may be oncology related as an example or something like that, pain management example. So we have something at NAMI called Hearts and Minds where we want to educate more people about the interconnection between the physical health and the mental health. And I think that will help us better understand the context of when we're talking to someone in the context of assisted suicide, what does that context mean? And again, what is their story and what's that background? Great question. Hi, um, thank you so much for talking about this. I try not to like scream like, yes, the whole time. Um, I personally have dealt with a lot of mental health issues over the years and I had a book published about my experiences, but um, I'm just asking, I feel like in my rural town that I was in, because I was kind of very public about my struggles and being in the mental health care system for like, and in hospitals for about a year and a half, um, I'm kind of the person people call when there's an emergency um, for that, and it's pretty overwhelming, and I, I want all this <laughs> to come to my small town. So, like, what would be, you know, I, I even had a church come to me and said, we have a space, do you have a program? Mm. And I didn't really know, because NAMI's not really active in our area, and I didn't really know, but, like, what would be, like, actual steps. I know um, the Hannah Grimes Center, you know, shares their resources and wants and their um, programs freely, but I didn't know if there was like actual steps that I could tell my community, other people could tell their communities because, I mean, I'm like freaking lit up about this because I'm like, this is so needed yeah. more than anything. Yeah. So then trying to figure out how to take home tangible mental health first aid instructors. So finding the instructors and actually going to mental health first aid to be the teacher is the question. Like where to start from there. Yeah. Um, Corinne, think, do you want to? Yeah, I've got some, I've got some thoughts. Um, yep. And Julia knows this well because Julia and I worked together for a couple of years. But even when you have those classes in your community, in a rural area, when you are an outspoken advocate, people catch on to that and you're going to be that person. Like I still get, like I was went to a bar last night and had someone like pull me aside and like want to talk about it. Um, so it doesn't really, that issue, I don't want to say it's an issue, but that difficulty in, in boundaries is always going to be there. Um, but I think as far as getting those classes to the community, it's figuring out what organizations um, or people have funding to send trainers to go be trained in these classes to then be able to instruct and then figuring out those models of where can I teach? Where can, you know, everyone teach? Who needs these classes and how do we identify that and move forward? So it's really, like I just said, like in the beginning of this, it's just talking, talking, talking about it. And then knowing that being an, like, I'm the same in my community, it's small and I'm like all over Instagram, like here's what I've been through and here's what I do and, you know, all that stuff. So everyone's like, oh, that's someone, now that we're more open about talking about mental health, here's this person I can go talk to, where with those classes, we'll have more of those people so it doesn't put the burden on a few people in a community. So I guess that two, my two main points there are, it's awesome that people will come to you, but that's something that will probably keep happening because of where we're at in our society is not everyone's that open yet. So when people see it, they flood to it and they're like, oh my gosh, this girl's so great. Let me talk to her. Like she's going to give me all the knowledge. 
But then it's kind of like how on the back end can we make sure mental health first aid and NAMI and all of these different things are happening so that way when that happens, we can turn people to other resources too. I don't know if that answers your question or if that was just a convoluted re-explanation of what you already said. <laughs> Corinne, I just want to add, because I know we've done this with your chapter and others, I refer to it as the digital front door that literally call your NAMI state region and ask them if there's someone on staff that can tell you if there is a virtual whatever, right? I actually, right before the session, got a request from a NAMI neighboring state to see if we were doing a NAMI family to family in Spanish, family to familia. And the answer was no, but I went on the Slack and on the Slack, I discovered that in Santa Clara, they have a Friday Zoom familia de familia. And so that resource is there for you. Think of it as a digital front door. Where is someone putting that welcoming mat where someone from our rural community can participate? So long as there's internet access and so long as they can be able to get on the computer. Um, but that digital front door exists. And then, yeah, Couple. mental health first aid is all virtual and online. So you can become an instructor and a NAMI you know, instructor as well and then bring it to Keene specifically. So just mentalhealthfirstaid.org and then working to open a chapter, yeah, a local chapter. Great, mm -hmm. we've got, thank you. We've got two, two questions lined up here, so. I'm so curious about getting this, it sort of uh, piggybacks off of her question, getting this into classrooms in the hands of teachers and camp counselors and our OBGYN providers and pediatricians because though it's part of the common practice when you go into the doctors for the nurse as they're taking your blood pressure and whatnot to ask something like, um, have you considered thoughts of harming yourself recently? In that moment as they're doing all these other things, I'm not sure how many people answer honestly to that, but I guess more to the point is how to, the, back to this idea of prevention, how to, you know, get it into parents' minds early on and guardians' minds early on and also children, right? So it's great that it's not stigmatized for our teens at this point. Um, that's wonderful. But just kind of wondering about teachers and, and these other people who are working with children early on and also, you know, even more to the point, thinking of prevention. In our rural communities, I think one of the things that not always, but often we have are green spaces. Mm -hmm. And how are we communicating um, how that, how right, like time outdoors, time in nature, it is prevention. We have enough data and research now so that we can start to eliminate, hopefully, the need for all of this, but also like 988, I didn't know about that, mental health, like I, there are so many things that you're talking about that I don't know about, and I'm like, how can this be out there and I don't know, right? So yeah. just wondering about that. Well, that's I why I brought them here today, for sure, yeah. so we can all learn. But um, going back, Mental Health First Aid actually has a class for um, first responders, um, police, um, firefighters, and then um, I've taught to school teachers. I think, Corinne, you've gone into schools too. So you can go and work with whatever school you're hoping to get certified, work with all the teachers. Um, that's when I mentioned with Corinne, making sure your gatekeepers and your partners are strong, because you'll email the school district, um, the, the board and say, you know, we've got this awesome free evidence-based curriculum. We want to train your teachers. And then hopefully they'll do that as their, what, what do we call that? One of their training days, I think. They just all- Their professional in. development days is when we try to get in there. But with, with the teen mental health first aid class, a requirement for that is that 10% of school staff are trained in the youth mental health first aid. So that way the whole school kind of has that same framework. So if students who are being taught the teen, you know, are um, referring to things that they've learned. It's the same language across. So that's kind of how we get into that, those teachers. Most of the time we get teachers are way more excited about learning these kind of things because um, that's just in their nature. So we get way more than 10% staff in a school who want to learn this. And then, then that's kind of how we, we reach those people. Um, and then I think it really is just helping our local governments and trying to show them how important it is and have them reaching out to organizations. So like your, your police, your fire departments, your whatever other departments need that training is really getting kind of government push and like citizen push of like, I want my police officers trained in mental health first aid. So why would I not like advocate for that? 
I, I just want to uh, jump in on this uh, wonderful question as well, because you're asking about, you know, how do we bring this sort of thinking to schools and young kids early on and per, sort of nip it in the bud before it gets... Well, one of the most powerful curriculums out there, in, in, as far as I know, is called social emotional learning in the schools, um, which, you know, is not a mental health treatment per se, but it's giving kids the language and the awareness to understand about their emotional states in a way that they might not otherwise. Um, and I would suggest that if, if schools are not doing that, they should, because there's so, much, um, uh, there's so much difficulties now in our young people across the country that arming them better to cope with their mental illness um, is, or future mental illness is so significant. And I think our digital age, as wonderful as it is, is sometimes uh, fueling that um, dysregulation and that it, this inability to control our feelings and regulate them. So one thing about schools is social emotional learning, very, very important. Uh, there's a great book um, uh, called Permission to Feel out there uh, that I just had the opportunity to read. It's a great resource. Um, I would recommend that to anybody kind of understanding about that. And your other question about some more systemic questions um, about how do you get the OBGYN and the physicians and all the people on board, and uh, I don't have a specific answer, but I do have a, a story that um, I recently underwent a routine preventive medical procedure uh, at our local hospital. And, um, you know, when you go before the thing, they ask you, do you have blood pressure? Or what meds are you on? You know, what's your weight? And blah, blah, blah. And went down this checklist, and then the nurse said, are you safe at home? Which I thought was a tremendous question to ask, getting at domestic violence or homelessness or whatever, but the notion that this mental health uh, introduction was a part of the normal process of getting a colonoscopy. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. And so I think policies and procedures and practices are slowly changing, and maybe there's some way to advocate for those in your local community too. One more thing to also, add. On okay. um, Thursday, sorry, on Thursday, Childkind International has a psychologist, um, um, a board psychologist who's going to be focusing on pediatric pain care for clinicians. Um, she spearheaded the Comfortability Project. Um, and that's a totally free webinar. A lot of MDs and clinical professionals will go, but if, if you too want to go to learn more about the program that she's running, um, it is Thursday. I'm trying to do the time change, making sure. For, okay, so it's um, 12 p.m. Eastern time Thursday, and it's Childkind International, building a systemic network to support mm -hmm. evidence-based psychological care in pediatric chronic pain. And I can connect with you later if you want to get more information on how to register. <laughs> and sorry, Corinne, didn't mean to cut you off. No, all good. I just wanted to add, too, that with these things, like there's a bunch of different populations that we really want to have this information. But a lot of them are just taxed out. So making it as easy as possible for them to get that information is huge. So, for example, like when we want to teach in schools, we package it so the administration has to do the least amount of work as possible. So that way that those students and those faculty members are able to get that education. I think the same thing would need to happen for any other type of frontline worker who has a bunch of things they're doing already for the community. And then now they're expected to talk about mental health or understand mental health on top of it. I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that, but we need to be able to give that to them in a way and teach them in a way that is not going to burn them out and make it attractive for them to ask those questions and be part of that movement. So making it it's like for us who are like in the field and interested and have the energy, do as much of that, that um, front end work as possible to make it as easy for them to participate as we can. Thank you. Following through, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> following through on the assisted suicide theme, I have known of a couple of individuals with progressive um, refractory neurologic conditions. One was Parkinson's disease, one was Huntington's chorea, uh, who just had terrible lifestyles and made the decisions uh, to be moving to uh, to, I think, Washington State for assisted suicide. 
Similarly, three or four years ago, there was a woman who I knew of uh, with a moderately rapidly progressing dementia. And she, with her husband and, and, uh, and her two children, two adult children, she was in her 60s, maybe even early 70s at the time, um, made arrangements to fly to Switzerland um, for the assisted suicide to be taking place um, on a Thursday or Friday, but they went over on Monday or Tuesday and, and, they, and they spent, as, as a close family, two or three very pleasant vacation days enjoying restaurants, enjoying scenery, enjoying the lovely atmosphere of Switzerland. And then on the Thursday morning, they went into a facility and, uh, and she apparently had a, had a peaceful suicide. And, um, and I'm wondering if, if um, this is occasionally or more frequently used for people with refractory mental health disorders. You've been in the field longer than I have, but I'll, I, I just literally came from a conference and fundraiser in New York that was talking about this issue for Alzheimer's, ALS, Huntington's disease, MS, and Parkinson's. Right, five very difficult neurodegenerative diseases. What we were discovering is one of the top barriers to the quality of life going forward other than research in and of itself is mental health is what they say. And so we're looking to organizations, whether it be Alzheimer's Association or there are now startup organizations, one run by a gentleman named Jed Levine out of New York City. And Jed has created this flip the script on Alzheimer's and he brings a couple that she's been living with dementia for 10 years and her husband tells the story on her behalf of all the things she's been able to see and all the things she's been able to hear and all the things she's been able to feel since her diagnosis. And it's flipping the script a little bit because they've created a peer support network that now is expanding all across the state of New York, not just New York City proper. And so reaching out and recognizing that those diseases don't know any barriers geographically. So if you're living in a rural area and you don't have that support network, of course you're gonna be struggling. So I'm looking to some of these innovative small nonprofit organizations that are tackling that problem and really excited and looking how does NAMI and its hearts and minds concept actually partner with them. And then I just wanted to add my little piece to your great question. We have NAMI Provider. Um, it has been around for a number of years and it is a family member. It is a person with lived expertise themselves and it is a actual provider. The three of them on equal level playing field present 15 hours of coursework. NAMI Iowa is the first one that got it to be required for every first year med student. We're now working in Colorado that it will be required for every graduate school of professional psychology student. The reason that's important to rural health care is many of these individuals want to go back to the area from whence they came and serve their community. So if we can, through things like NAMI Provider, actually do that, we're helping with your issue because there's this better connection between hearts and minds, and we're helping with your issue that's saying, how do we get to all these providers? Well, if we can get nursing schools, schools of public health, schools of social work, medical schools, dental schools, all participating in NAMI provider, the landscape is far stronger. I can always count on you, Bob, to ask a tough question. I don't know how, to, <laughs> I don't know uh, how to ferret out the right answer when it comes to assisted suicide. That's a vexing medical ethical question. I don't think our society in the United States has wrestled with it enough, and there are so many potential uh, abuses in the works, and w I think there's many states with legislation that actually prevents one person from assisting in the suicide or the other. Um, so uh, I, I just have uh, tremendous hope that somewhere we'll find it, the answer to this, but I don't see it on the horizon. That's fair. I don't really know what to say to you. Questions are always welcome here, so.
So thank you, each of you, for all the ways you are contributing and supporting people and um, helping us lean in to possibilities that are really helping us think outside the box. Um, I do want to thank you for lifting up rural communities as being a, um, a group or community that really does have a lot of assets. Just what you said that, you know, the power of a community, sometimes it really is difficult in an urban setting to address an issue, but community solutions um, can happen easier at the rural level. And I'm from Maine, and many of our rural communities are doing just that. Just prioritizing issues that they want to work on and at the you know, boot level just out there doing it. And um, our youth mattering work that I in, um, introduced yesterday, cultivating youth mattering um, in, as a prevention model for suicide and um, sadness and hopelessness is getting um, traction within rural communities early on because People lean in and want to be part of the solution. And well, how can I? What can I do? How can I help? So thank you for lifting up that rural communities really are great. Ass, you know, have the assets to do this work. So thanks. Well, th thank you for um, jumping in because you know, the, to, to me, the other part of that uh, statement is the notion that um, way back in the early days of our republic, right? Uh, there was a uh, French nobleman, Alexis de Tocqueville, who came to the United States to study American democracy. And one of the observations he made was that American democracy is so special because people think they're all in it together. They live in tiny villages. They, they want to build a church, they build a church. They want to find a fire station, they make a fire station. There, there was a notion that democracy works because people feel we're all in this together. And I think that is so absent from many of our um, places in the United States now, but in rural communities, like in the, in the community I live in, people actually have that sense that we're all in this together. We're not going to get help from Concord. We're not going to get help necessarily from Washington all the time. You know, and we're in this tucked away in this little corner. We're not Vermont. We're not M Massachusetts, and that's okay, and we're going to have to figure it out. And I, I think that what makes the heart of democracy really work. Any other questions? I'll hop on the virtual chat to see too. Um, I just wanted to say, I don't know if anyone wanted to speak to hiding in plain sight because Phil, when you hosted uh, a preview of that um, video series here in Keene, that was phenomenally instructive to me to go to that. And I don't know if you wanted to say a minute or two. It, it feels like that fits into this realm of recognizing sure. the youth and giving them the power to find their solutions. Yeah. Um, actually, um, it's an interesting story. Thanks for bringing it up, Kitty. You know, uh, Florentine Films um, exists in Walpole, New Hampshire, <laughs> right up the street. Um, and Ken Burns and his wonderful organization has obviously been part part of many, many uh, wonderful document documentaries about American life. And um, part of many of his colleagues collaborated recently on a film called Hiding in Plain Sight. It was aired on PBS in July, and it was a two-part, four-hour um, uh, documentary about youth mental illness and young people facing it. Um, powerful. If you haven't seen it, it's probably the, the best um, anti-stigma documentary out there that I've ever seen. Um, the uh, stories from these young people are powerful. They'll bring a tear to your eye, so have a box of tissues if you, um, <laughs> if you have one. Um, and so we had a, a small showing uh, here in Keene with the filmmaker and the producer and one of the uh, young people uh, featured in the film. Um, so I think that the film is gonna be a powerful tool for us in the education world about um, what y many youth have to go through and um, how communities can help them, over, you know, with their own recovery and health. Thanks for being here. Kitty, that, that's the power of film, the power of art, right? Going back to Parkinson's, there is a Dance for Parkinson's organization that also mm -hmm. had started, right? And so I bet if we surveyed individual couples that went into Dance for Parkinson's and asked them these questions, 
that cared about mental health, they're coming out of dance for Parkinson's in a stronger mental state than they were going into it would be one thing. But there is Ernie and Joe, if you Google Ernie and Joe cops, you will see this story about two cops down in Texas who are trying to change the trajectory for how does law enforcement respond to people that are in crisis and what is their role. And we in NAMI Colorado are bringing Ernie to our state conference to be able to share. None of us should be too proud to say that our rural or our urban community gets it right. Um, that if I'm gonna model after something great, North Texas is an example, unrelated to Ernie and Joe, is doing a program that is peer-to-peer -peer for the police officers themselves because the police officers don't want to go to their EAP program and they don't want to go to their manager. They want a safe spot. So they would rather go across the street in rural North Texas and sit and have a beer with someone who's their compatriot but who was also professionally trained by a peer-to-peer -peer organization. And so we are so excited to see that firefighters and law enforcement and parole officers are interested in this model too. So that's the next stage, is then these things come to film, they get digitized, and they get memorialized so others can model after them. Thank you. Um, just to follow up as well is thinking about um, the power of relational health, right, and social connectedness. So if we do create environments and conditions where people grow up in communities feeling socially connected, I mean, what a wonderful prevention model that takes away that stigma and addresses um, many addresses across many disease entities, just not depression or anxiety, but just being socially connected. So that investment really is pretty little um, for you know, the work of community to st get connected and stay connected. And um, there's a lot of work to be done in recovery coming out of the pandemic around that, since so many of us have lived in isolation now for a couple of years. But I just want to remind us that just that relational health, which really doesn't Cost, it's, you know, there's no price tag on that. It's, it's human to human, right? Very good point. You know, and um, the health insurance, the big, big guy, Cigna, right, I've, I've always, um, every five years, I think, studies loneliness in the United States because they believe loneliness is a significant health threat equivalent to, you know, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, mm -hmm. so they say, right? And they actually chart which communities in the United States are the most loneliest um, because it's such a powerful uh, health threat. So the connection is the antidote for loneliness. That's actually why we designed this session to be, yes, healthcare workers were on there, but we wanted community leaders, individuals, artists to come and take these home and bring it to their communities too, to have a whole collaboration of people. This might be a little off topic, but since we're toward the end, I, there was this thing, I can't remember what country, some Norwegian country or something, and um, they had, uh, there was a name for it, these benches that were put out around the community, right? And the, and the idea was just that there was someone there, just mm -hmm. going to that, back to the idea of relationship building. It makes me think about um, the retired people in, in our communities. Um, who might, you know, be having feelings of loneliness or whatever. How do we really sort of like work together as a community to create these safe spaces where you could just go and sit with a person and talk and share and know that it's a safe space? Um, I loved reading about that and hearing about it. Yeah, like uh, we're so nuclear family focused sometimes in the United States. You really have to intentionally put yourself out there, share a bench with a friend and, and listen. So, yeah, I love those benches. <laughs> um, I've just been thinking here, I'm like, um, there just needs to be like a giant wave of people going into this work. Is there any like plans that y'all know about of um, trying to just get ahead of the game? Because I feel like, um, you know, Maybe somebody might think, oh, well, I don't feel like I want to be a therapist. Mm -hmm. But there's just so many ways that you could, um, like, trickle out to, to help with this. And, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking, like, 
oh my gosh, I'm halfway through my life. Like, <laughs> you know, how, how can our youth have that in their head, like as a little spark to go into this type of work because we're gonna need a lot of people. <laughs> Right. I think the, the balance is, right, we're in a public health crisis when it comes yeah. to mental health. So this doesn't happen overnight. What we have seen with the American Rescue Plan and all the different ideas that are happening at the states, the good news there is if someone doesn't like federal spending, it's up to the states how to spend those dollars. So in Colorado, we've decided to apportion a, a piece of our $450 million to go to community gap grants. So if a rural community says, we don't have any counselors, we have a marriage counselor, but they're not licensed to provide care, then we can look at the licensing issue with that community gap. If there are only peer supports, we can use money to actually pay peer support specialists at a rate that is far more matched up to their worth than what they're getting paid. And so I think a lot of states are actually looking at the peer model and how can we pay peers because it's one of the things you can do the fastest and that you can train up within a weekend. You can actually give someone the training they need to be able to do that with some intensive core, evidence-based coursework. So um, keep the faith, tell everyone you know they should go into this field. Um, know that I've still got on my bucket list at some point in time, so it's that or preschool teacher, but neither of them support the three kids right now, so. <laughs> it, it does happen in communities too. I think, Corinne, you might be able to talk a little bit, but they were paying people to be peer support specialists and to go back to school to do that. I'm, I know with my experience with direct service, I can't be a therapist. I hold on to stories and narratives a little too close to my heart. So I'm studying masters in public health so I can still embrace them and support the mental health challenges our society sees, but do it on a little macro level rather than direct service. But investigate and see what your state has to offer around grants available so that you can become that instructor, that peer-to-peer -peer support specialist, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? I might, I might just jump in with one more thought myself because you all are raising such great ideas and, um, and just thinking about Chloe Maxman and the kindness mm -hmm. concept and going back to the thought about, you know, sort of how do we all em embrace this and sit with the people out on the bench and, you know, say hello and be sure that we're recognizing each other. And so John Prine comes to mind, if people know John Prine's music as a, an old folky, I love it, but hello in there. <laughs> so it's really, yay, some people know it, so yes. Um, you know, it's just really seeing eye to eye as we go down the street in our small towns and saying hello. Mm -hmm. Hello in there. How you doing? And any chance you can get to be a stigma stomper is huge too, you know? Active listening and then the more you share your story, if you feel empowered to do so, the more others will do the same. So leading by example in that way is a very significant way to make that change. I think going off what Kitty said too, being honest with how we're doing when we're in those moments where someone asks, like you're walking down the street and someone's like, hey, Julia, how are you? Julia actually, like not just being like, good. Her being like, nah, I'm okay, or I'm super tired, or it's actually a really hard day, I'm struggling. And if we, as just like community members do that, then that culture shifts as well. Yeah, and embracing it's okay to not be okay. And you don't always have to put that front on. Phil is definitely way more scholarly than I am because he's quoting Democracy in America. Um, uh, there, there is a book by Z Xavier Amador called I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. And following on that book, um, he started the LEAP method, which is mm -hmm. listen, empathize, agree, and partner. And I would encourage any of you who kind of want to follow up on Kitty's remark about how can we even be more present, you can take that training. There are virtual trainings for LEAP. Um, I would even encourage you to ask your employer to pay for it or to pay for the time that you're missing work because that would change the trajectory on how our employers are also thinking about this. It's worth your while as an employer or do we get state funding to send people, right? So um, go back to my comment about the librarians. They're awesome at listening and when the kid says, I, there's no way I'm gonna get this term paper done, they empathize and then you start talking and they agree and then they partner with you. So they've been using LEAP for years, right? So um, it's, we've started actually looking at 
making sure more of the NAMI volunteers can participate and actually be trained in the LEAP method as well. That's great. Any other final follow-up questions, comments? All right, well, we have charcuterie. Uh, <laughs> So I just want to say I, uh, I got charcuterie from the co-op, so please help yourself to food, refreshment. We can mingle afterwards. You can ask us any, any further questions you may have. Um, right after this is the end of the whole Radically Rural session. It's the Liveability Slam happening at 4 o'clock. Um, so stick around here, get some refreshments, and thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Oh, and there's an after party at 7 o'clock, too. Oh, Sophie! Oh, Sophie! Oh, darn it. Oh.